and we're back live here at the Guideville Insights Lounge here at the Oliver Wyman Health Innovation Summit. Hi everyone, this is Kate Warnock and I have such a distinguished guest joining us, Dr. Marty McCary. Dr. McCary, welcome. Good to be with you, Kate. We're happy to have you. We saw you a couple years ago at the first Oliver Wyman Health Innovation Summit that we did, so it's a delight to have you back. Great to be back. All right, so Dr. McCary, you are the Professor of Surgery and Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. McCary, you're going to be discussing creating change through human behavior. Your panel is that later today or is it tomorrow? Yeah, this afternoon. This afternoon. Oh, that's yeah. right. Just in a few minutes, actually. Yep. How has your expertise on patient safety informed this talk, and will we hear any surprises? Well, you know, um, my research team often says, where do you get research ideas from? And I tell them that by practicing medicine and being on the front lines, there are so many systems that can be better designed that you get ideas just from practicing. And you know, when I get involved in research, oftentimes the patients keep me grounded. Um, they'll ask me questions like what to expect after surgery. And I might go into the litany of complications, statistically deciding the odds of those complications happening. But the reality is sometimes they'll cut me off and say, whoa, doc, look, I just wanna know when can I mow the lawn again? <laughs> or when can I hold my granddaughter? And those are the things that remind us that what's important are patient-centered outcomes when we talk about quality and safety in healthcare. Uh, you know, I had a patient recently ask, what are the odds that I would develop pancreatic cancer in my lifetime? And you know, we never think of things like that. We think of the incidence rate is 38,000 deaths per year. We think of the increased risk with different risk factors. But I've never thought about what are the chances that somebody without any risk factors will just develop cancer at some point in their lifetime. And I asked all the other colleagues uh, that I have, what are the odds? And they would cite the incidence rate, the death fatality. But I said, no, no, the question that he's asking yeah. is, what are the odds? The odds are one in 67. We don't tend to think of things yeah. in science from that patient perspective. Right, right. You know, and I, I think what you, you you share with us is it's really it's the consumer imperative it's the overarching theme for the health innovation summit and uh, you know obviously you're interacting with patients every single day so as you said they keep you grounded and, and probably challenge you to think in different ways so all right dr mccary our next question for you then is there a parallel here some health enterprises hope to quote delight their customer in new ways before they perfected the basics of their business can the same be said of health practitioners and new medical technology? Well, you know, in the, at this conference, there are a lot of healthcare startup companies, and they want to address a, a pain in society, a, an obstacle that patients have, a barrier to quality health care. And to be honest with you, the hunger for some innovation outpaces the, matur the maturity of the quality data. And what we have sometimes is this desire to try to navigate patients and give them the tools to navigate their care, but the reality is we just don't have those metrics. They're not that mature yet. We don't want to simply direct people to the doctors with the lowest mortality rate because they, they may be the doctors that are taking care of the most uh, low risk patients. Maybe, you know, so there are all these issues of risk adjustment and in general, in the field of innovation in healthcare, i.e. startups and patient navigation tools, the hunger for some fresh new idea and for some way to help navigate patients using good data has outpaced our ability to produce data with good, solid, mature quality metrics that are endorsed by doctors and that doctors can rally around. So that's been the challenge in healthcare and you know, oftentimes we'll ask, what do we do with statistical outliers in healthcare? And if you ask non-doctors, they'll say, well, we gotta put them in jail and we gotta hunt them down and we gotta get them out of the system. If you ask doctors, they know that most of us, the by and large, the vast majority of people that go to med school go in with great intentions and we, the response from doctors about outliers is we need to have a one-on-one -on -one sit down. We need to address the outliers. We need to instruct them, guide them, right. help them. Right. And it's a whole different 
approach to quality in healthcare. Very good. Well, interesting too, your perspective. I always enjoy hearing it. All right, another question for you then, Dr. McCary. Transparency in care delivery has led you to pioneer the adoption of common sense solutions, like letting patients see their, their doctor's notes in real time. I saw that published recently. I think on your Facebook page you were talking about that. And lifting visiting hour restrictions so that families can be more involved. How do you scale these solutions across the industry? Well, you know, I think increasingly hospitals are asking, can you give us a toolkit to improve quality and safety? And we're saying, hey, look at the great ideas out there. Doctors have great homegrown ideas all across America, and a lot of times we just need to listen to them. You know, um, for example, we just built a new hospital at one of our affiliates. Uh, it's a wholly owned Johns Hopkins Hospital called Sibley Memorial Hospital right in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. We don't have steps into the bathroom or the shower or from the bed. Why? Because falls are a big problem. Sure. We have night lights. This is a brand new hospital with state-of-the-art technology catering to patient safety and trying to ask how can we design healthcare better so it's smart, so we can reduce hazards, so we can have nurses in close range based on where they sit. How can we design the rooms and the floors and the whiteboards to write down all the information a patient needs to know so they can ask the right questions and be informed. And this is sort of the fun part about healthcare right now. People are hungry for fresh new ideas. And I think we're seeing that all across America. And it's, it's, it's a really exciting time. Well, how exciting, too, that you can tap right into your own best ideas right in your own hospital setting amongst your employees, the people that work with their patients every single day that have these simple breakthroughs that can really make an extraordinary difference, like removing a step into a shower. And, you know, people sometimes think, oh, it's neat that you invented the surgery checklist. Or, you know, I didn't invent the concept of a checklist. As a matter of fact, Industries all over have been using them for centuries. But what we do is we put out there a lot of different ideas. We throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall. Mm -hmm. And we ask doctors, do you find this helpful? Do you find this helpful in achieving better outcomes? Do you find this good for safety? Do you believe, without any scientific analysis, we'll ask them, do you believe that this makes care safer. And when the docs are telling you, when the voice of frontline docs are telling you, yeah, this makes sense, this is gonna prevent those rare events, we realize, look, we can listen to doctors and not wait for the giant randomized control trials that'll never capture rare events right. in a short period of time to measure innovation. So I think we need to get away from the idea that we have to have a randomized controlled trial to evaluate whether or not something is good for patients because the reality is we'll be paralyzed for years with inadequate funding and inadequate feasibility of doing these trials. And just ask the doctors, look, do you think this is good for patients? And ask patients, do you think this is something you would find helpful? And that's the cool thing about the startup and innovation community right now in healthcare. It is a quick moving, fresh new idea culture. And I think, you know, when we look at the stuff we've done, the surgery checklist, uh, the work against bloodstream infections, measuring safety culture with a safety attitudes questionnaire. Um, we didn't develop the open notes program, but we certainly advocated for it. All of these great new ideas that are out there were all things that we basically put in front of frontline docs and asked them, do you think this is helpful? You know, and I would think too that that's helping to address that burnout rate. You know, we're hearing more and more the uh, the physicians, the clinicians who are practicing and feeling like they're not able to to practice the medicine that they went to school, but first inspired them to help people because they're bogged down with bureaucracy yeah. and other things. So here you're giving them an outlet yeah. and really helping them be engaged in, in an outcome that's far beyond just their immediate practice. So I, I think that's another benefit, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. They want to be, docs want to be part of the solution. You know, the safety crisis is a big problem. The medical care gone wrong is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And docs are getting crushed out there. First of all, they're getting unfairly blamed for a lot of the problems. They're getting hit with lowering reimbursements, higher uh, costs, higher overhead costs, lowering payments from Medicare and payers, increasing malpractice premiums, and now all these regulatory requirements. Docs are getting crushed out there. And they're starting to say, look, do we have to put up with this? And we're seeing a revolt, almost a revolution 
in the medical community among doctors. You're seeing this in primary care with concierge medicine. They're saying, heck with all the payer, payment, paper, paperwork, regulatory stuff, we're just going to practice medicine the way we've always dreamed we've wanted to practice it. We'll make house calls, yeah. we'll, you, get, you can have our phone number, you pay a standard subscription fee, and this is what concierge medicine is doing, and they're saying, heck with all the traditional healthcare system stuff that we had to do, and instead of being forced to see five patients in an hour, you have my unlimited attention, and we'll do a full, in-depth, preventive screening, proactive, dietary, lifestyle, good primary health care visit. And that's sort of the relationship that a lot of these docs have been craving. The concern we have, of course, in health policy is are we creating a two-tiered system? The reality is that's a global trend. That goes on everywhere. There's a private and a public system in every country in the world. Uh, unfortunately, we're getting there via a doctor revolt against all the regulatory and other reasons that doctors are getting crushed right now. Well, so to your point, Dr. Mercari, hopefully this is where, you know, there's such a tremendous opportunity for, for pain points like that, what's, what's forcing that revolution that you said, that maybe there's a way to tap into a solution that more people can benefit from, that it's not necessarily going to create a healthcare disparity in our population. So and one final question for you, because I know you need to get going for your okay. panel. Um, all right, you are active on social media, and I, I love that. Uh, in the two years since we've last spoken to you, your Twitter following is gigantic. Um, <laughs> do you feel that using social media has made you more transparent to your to total combined? You've got 43,000 followers. and do you oh, ad It's true, 43,000. And do you advise more health executives to make the move to social? Well, I think social media is great, and I think one of the reasons people have rallied around some of the messages of our research and writing and advocacy work at Johns Hopkins is that uh, we're concerned. We're concerned about the trends in healthcare. We're concerned about the fact that the doctor burnout rate is as high as it's ever been. Sure. We're concerned about corporate medicine and hospital monopolies. We're concerned about the whole sort of back system of the grid, if you think of the energy uh, industry. Energy is produced and it's used, but there's an entire grid where energy is bought and sold. And we had the doctor and the patient, but now we have a grid behind us of a gigantic industry where our services are being bought and sold and discounted and marked up. And it's, we're starting to say, hey, wait a minute, can we streamline healthcare to make it more efficient? Because to be honest with you, this is just as a, the patient advocate side of doctors. Our patients are complaining to us. They're telling us, hey, I can't afford this. My premium is crushing me. Half of America makes $42,000 or less in income. The average mean income in America is $42,000. When your deductible is $10,500 for a family, as it is on the bronze plans on the exchange, that's the average deductible for a household, People are getting crushed out there, and we as docs need to be advocates for our patients. Understandably. Well, Dr. Mercari, I know that you're going to have a fascinating conversation <laughs> with the panel that you're going to be leading Thanks. in just a little while, so thank you for taking the time to join us here at the Guidel Insights Lounge. My name is Kate Warnock. We're going to be up with another guest in just a moment. Please keep watching.